Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I welcome a guest who brings a story of a loved one. This is an impactful episode with a moving story. It is a story of remembrance that shifted to a mission to support infants and their families through long hospital stays. In a way, it is a story about community, a community that turned into a family. But first, what is community and why is it important and why should an entrepreneur care? Community is a group of people who live in the same area such as a city, town, or a neighborhood. But the definition of community goes even broader than that. It can be a group of people that have the same interests, religion, race, etc., or a group of nations. This world and all of its inhabitants that are in it, this is our global community. Coworkers, colleagues, friends, and neighbors are all part of our community. Now, why is it important to build a rapport with community? Well, from my own personal experience hosting this podcast, working with the community builds trust and support. Entrepreneurs come on this show because they trust my work and in me as a podcast host. They trust I will not lead them astray, and in turn, I trust they will respect the studio, me, and my family. Additionally, the support I have received from this community is grand. Trust is important because if a customer does not trust the brand, they will not buy the brand. It is remarkable how quickly customers can become a loyal tribe when you engage their community. Investing in communities helps build brand awareness while providing an opportunity to share ideas with various platforms. This little community that has been helping me grow this podcast is incredible, and I could not thank them all enough. Honestly, thank you. But the community is not about me. I look at this platform as an opportunity to showcase their stories and that of others. I want the global community to learn about our Oregon community. But why is this so important to an entrepreneur? An enthusiastic member of a community that loves meeting new people and learning about new businesses is a great asset for any brand. Harvard Business Review had an article titled, when community becomes a competitive advantage that highlights the importance of building a superior business model through engaging community. And here are a few highlights. Enthusiastic members help acquire new members, resulting in low customer acquisition costs and tight viral loop. A great example is my guests on this podcast. I share their brand, story, IG posts, and marketing their company simply by marketing the podcast to the community. Members are loath to abandon the community resulting in increased retention and therefore improve lifetime value. Loathe means reluctant or unwilling, meaning once members are a part of the community, many are never willing to leave the community, which creates sustainability for economic growth in the community. Lastly, members support one another, resulting in high gross margins due to low cost of service. Again, take this podcast as an example. This is no cost to the community, but I truly hope it provides immense value to the listeners and the entrepreneurs. Now, why care? Because small businesses in communities help set the culture. Not only small businesses, but nonprofits as well. They help build our identity. Even giving helps feed the soul. Research has shown volunteer work and kindness can lower symptoms of depression and make us high on dopamine and endorphins. Listen, We have all been through a lot these past couple of years. It is difficult to find the highs in what feels like are so many lows. But this next guest exemplifies how hope can be found even when the light fills its darkest. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Please welcome the creator of Foxbox, 
This episode is sponsored in part by Burnside Knives, essential tools for outdoor enthusiasts and working professionals like yourself. Visit BurnsideKnives.com. Your knife says a lot about you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I'm here of the creator of Fox Boxes, Kat Miller. Kat, how are you doing? I'm doing okay. Thanks for having me. We've been actually chatting for a little bit, and so we've been kind of catching up. Uh, Really, really awesome, awesome uh, nonprofit you created here. But first, before we get into that, introduce the world to Kat Miller. Please give us, uh, give the listeners at home, introduce (laughs) them to Kat. (laughs) Um, I am a mom. I uh, live in Portland, Oregon, and I have spent my career in design. Um, I started in branding and advertising as an art director, and I um, I left to work on products and technology um, because I really love the idea of uh, building something that is useful for someone else. And um, mobile software was the first um, kind of introduction to that for me. And right. yeah, yeah. Now, I, I want to talk about Fox Boxes, but before I get into that, I'm going to kind of, I'm going to save that question because I think it's a great story. First, I, now Fox Boxes, for the folks at home that may not be aware, this is a, a nonprofit organization. Uh, so first, let's, let's talk about how does one start a nonprofit? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. I think it really relies on um, what is the point of the business that you're starting? And for us, because we're very mission driven, um, we, and we also wanted to align brands and private and public money, um, a nonprofit structure makes a lot of sense. Okay. Now, now is this your first business? So I, so I started in advertising and uh, moved into product design. And when I was working at a product design agency here in Portland, um, I met my now husband and we left uh, to start a a mobile prototyping design company. And we went through the Portland incubator experiment at White and Kennedy. Yeah. Yeah. So we went through that in, oh, uh, 2013, I think. And then we went through Techstars in Seattle in 2014. And then in 20, I think it was 2015, we shut that company down. And um, I went back to being a design consultant. Nice. So for the folks at home that may not be familiar with the um, PDX experience, Pi, can you kind of elaborate on your experience? Yeah. So Pi, um, Pi still exists. Um, It's an amazing organization um, that's run by Rick Tarosi. Um, And it, at the time when it was at White and Kennedy, it was this combination of um, kind of incubation of ideas and companies in conjunction with a design agency um, and with a really strong sense of community. And so for me, when I think about Pi then, and I think about Pi now, the biggest benefit, benefit for us was being able to be a part of that bigger community. Um, and I think that's something um, I didn't really realize until I was in my late 20s and 30s, just how important community really is. Um, and the Pi community is really quite wonderful. That's awesome. You know, and, and for those folks at home, Rick Trozzi of Pi was actually on this show before. So if you have not, go back and listen to it. However, you know, you mentioned a great word right now, community. Uh, in fact, before we uh, scheduled this, you informed me that there was another former guest that I actually kind of have a dotted line to you with, Brave Care, correct? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so how, how, let's talk about a little bit before we get further. Brave Care, where's the connection with Brave Care? Oh yeah, that's a that's a great story. Um, so actually, when Cypress, um, who inspired Fox Box, when he was born, um, about two weeks later, my husband started Brave Care with um, a group of amazing folks, um, and they are really focused on kind of revolutionizing and changing um, pediatric primary and urgent care. It's very true. And so again, for folks. Brave Care again with another former uh, former guest, and that's I think going back to that community thing. You know, Portland is is such a great community. Now, let's you mentioned you mentioned Cypress. Now, let's get into for the listeners at home. What is Fox Boxes, and how was the concept created? 
Yeah, absolutely. I love talking about Cyprus. Um, he was the most amazing baby. Um, so he was born in February of 2019, um, right in the middle of winter. And he just came out as a ray of sunshine, um, always happy, always laughing, giggling. Um, he loved music and he loved when um, folks would sing to him and he would try to sing along. Like he was just, he was just joy. And when he was, he had just turned four months old. And um, the month before that, he was feeling um, not so happy and was feeling kind of crummy, which was really different for us because he was the baby who slept through the night at a few weeks old. Um, he was rarely grumpy. Um, the only time he really cried was when he had to get clothes on, which, you know, I understand who wants to wear clothes. Uh, <laughs> he was just, uh, he was just so uh, joyful. And so when he um, started to not be that way, we became really concerned and we, um, we had a really similar story to a lot of parents of oncology patients. Um, there's something wrong with their kid. Can't quite figure it out. You take him to the doctor a few times and, um, you're kind of sent home, right? Because I think a lot of medicine is looking for, um, you don't look for zebras and, um, unfortunately, um, kids with cancer are zebras. It's, it's, um, it's uncommon, um, but it's not so rare that um, every major city has a pediatric oncology group. So um, we went to our pediatrician one night um, and they sent us to Dornbecker Children's Hospital to the ED. And we thought we would be there um, overnight. So we'd get antibiotics, we'd go home, uh, maybe be there for testing. So uh, overnight, a day or two. And um, that turned into two and a half months uh, because we found out that Cyprus had a really rare form of leukemia. Um, so uh, we had um, the kind of leukemia he had required us to stay in the hospital. So we were at Dornbecker um, for the majority of almost a year. Um, after that day, which actually was the early morning hours of July 4th, every time July 4th rolls around, it's, it's not so joyful for me. And we had uh, three rounds of chemotherapy. Um, we were fortunate enough, so lucky to have a bone marrow transplant. Um, and that was his only chance at a cure. And through that, we um, ended up spending a little over a month in the pediatric intensive care unit at Dornbecker. Then uh, Cyprus, I think part of what was really confusing about Cyprus's leukemia was that it um, showed up in his skin. Um, so when he was, um, it kind of looked like blisters and um, they were kind of in this diaper area. And so everyone kind of thought like it was a diaper rash uh, but it was actually uh, something called leukemia cutis. Um, and uh, he actually got it again. Um, so after transplant, before we could go home, um, it showed back up. We did, uh, what was it? Yeah, it was um, two weeks of outpatient radiation oncology at OHSU to control that um, because those, uh, those blisters are actually really painful. And then um, we found out he wasn't going to get better. So um, in May of 2020, we had his end of life at Dornbecker. And um, we did that because Cyprus so loved his hospital family. Um, so that same joyful baby um, that I described, when he started feeling a little bit better through chemotherapy, he was still just that joyful. Um, and he was the most joyful being around people. So I would walk him three to five miles a day around um, the oncology floor at Dornbecker uh, with him in a baby carrier and me pushing his giant IV pole. Um, and he just loved people and he loved his nurses. He loved his providers. He loved his therapists. Um, he loved his CNAs. He loved his hucks. He loved everyone. Um, and so uh, when we thought about having the best place for his end of life, it really made sense to do that in the place where um, he loved so many people. Love it. Now, now Cyprus 
used to carry something with them that that kind of inspired the creation of fox boxes am i correct oh foxy yes, yes. um so um he actually cypress being the joyful baby that he was he um he was never really attached to any toys or blankets um except for this fox um so a um a kind person that worked um, with my husband gave us um, a fox blankie. And I hadn't seen them before. So we have an, an older kiddo, Cypress's big brother. And when he was little, um, I, I never saw these amazing creations, but they're um, kind of like a small blanket um, with a stuffed animal head attached to it. So uh, we received a fox one. And there was a night where he was having a really hard time um, with uh, withdrawing from chemotherapy. So um, uh, in conjunction with chemotherapy, sometimes they give pain medications and those can be hard to kind of wean off of. And so kind of in the throes of that, um, I reached for a toy and I happened to grab the fox, which he hadn't really seen very often. And he just uh, grabbed it, held on to it and calmed down. And the rest was history. We actually had to um, buy 10 of them. <laughs> Um, because if you drop something um, on a hospital floor, but especially if you're an oncology patient, um, you can't touch yeah. that again until it's sanitized. And so um, there was a night where um, another night where he was having a hard time and um, he threw his fox on the floor. And I just remember staring at it thinking, oh, no, that's the one thing that calms him down. <laughs> And we had um, the the night uh, physician came in and they were like, well, is there anything that really calms him down? And I just remember staring at the fox and just saying through like such sleep deprived, um, you know, eyes and soul and voice. I was like, it's the fox, his fox on the floor. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, we learned really quickly to have um, multiple foxies, um, but he, he went everywhere with foxy um, and he really loved it. Um, but I actually, you know, it's interesting. So um, what inspired um, Foxbox was actually a, um, a saucer, an exosaucer from Skip Hop that um, just showed up at our house one day. Um, and a friend of ours um, who had a baby about a week before um, Cyprus was born um, sent it to us. And that, that gift provided so much hope in a way that I couldn't articulate. Um, it took away kind of that stress of financial burden of being able to buy something that was really expensive. Um, it took, it took uh, alleviated that stress of wanting to be able to provide the very best things for your baby away. And it actually just as an object itself provided Cyprus such um, independence. Um, it allowed him to have a place where he could do a lot of fine motor exploration. Um, he could sit, he could sit in his doorway. So um, oncology uh, rooms are really fascinating because they have something called uh, positive pressure. So the air actually pushes out. Mm -hmm. um, so if, even if you're immunocompromised and of course this is before, um, majority of his treatment was before COVID, but before COVID you could sit with the door open and socialize. And so we used to put his saucer in his doorway. And so he would be able to laugh and giggle with everyone that walked by. <laughs> um, we could do a lot of sign language, um, and singing, um, and, uh, just kind of see people. And so it, it provided him such independence in um, a way that you just couldn't anticipate. And actually um, one of our, one of our boxes at Fox box has that saucer in it. Oh, cute. Love it. So for, so, so for the folks at home, what, what, what does Fox box provides? That's a, it's a great question. So um, in a big way, we provide hope. Uh, so we are a 501c3 nonprofit and we're dedicated to supporting infants and their families through long hospital stays. And um, when we talk with our nurse friends, uh, provider friends, um, the families we've supported, uh, the families that uh, we talked to before we started Foxbox to get a better understand of what kind of um, support we could provide, um, the biggest thing that we provide is hope. Um, so, 
from a very like, um, like physical point of view, we provide um, boxes of helpful items. So for babies, um, we personalize our boxes based on their unique personalities, their likes and dislikes, their preferences. Um, and then we also um, tailor it to make sure that everything we include is evidence-based. So we include developmental activities, um, social emotional items and supports, um, educational items. So we love books. Um, so we provide a lot of um, really specific tailored items that help alleviate that, um, that feeling, that feeling I was describing earlier of you have this baby, they were just born because we support just infants zero to 12 months and you are suddenly in the situation where you are now living in a hospital that hospital room is your new nursery and a lot of parents spend a lot of time thinking about all the hopes and dreams in the future that they want for their baby and that doesn't go away when you stay in a hospital Um, but that doesn't get to be your priority anymore your priority is now being a medical advocate Um, you get to tell um, your nurse practitioners and your doctors and your therapists and your child life specialists and your social worker, you get to interpret how your baby's feeling and work with them to come up with a plan. And it doesn't take away all of the hope that you, you have for your baby. And I think um, something I experienced and something other families we've talked to have experienced is, um, when you're sitting in that hospital room and your baby has this world changing crisis diagnosis, it can be really hard to have hope. Um, you know, for me, it was really hard to buy toys. Um, so another family of ours who had an infant in treatment, it was really hard for them to buy clothes that were a size up. And so a lot of what we do at Foxbox, so we provide items that help now and we provide items that can scale to when they're older because we know that providing that hope and that story and that support and being here now in the moment and being there six months later with those same items is really important. Um, And so we support babies with boxes, but we also support um, the other really important people in that baby's life. And so that is um, the primary caregiver who's um, likely living with them in the hospital it's their siblings. And then we're also trying to figure out the best way to support their staff, their hospital family. Makes sense. Now, why, why was this so important? Why was, why was creating this so important to you? Yeah, I think I never thought or realized that babies were in the hospital. I knew that the NICU existed and there's that really great story Um, When you think about babies in the hospital, you just think of the NICU. Um, And in reality, there's so, so much more um, uh, support needed for infants who have really long hospital stays that aren't in the NICU. Um, And it was interesting because I thought a lot about it from a branding and storytelling and advertising perspective. And it's, it's a part of what, why Foxbox is important is because we want to tell the stories of babies and families that are in all aspects of the hospital um, to create awareness that there are families with infants who are living in the hospital every day. And um, unfortunately, um, the donations that are infant specific in all children's hospitals are rare. And, um, you know, from a, from a advertising, like from a branding, from a messaging and communication and design um, kind of perspective, I, when we were in treatment, I kind of, I struggled with that. I I really wanted to understand why. Um, And so we asked, um, we asked a lot of people. And I think what it really boils down to is that it's really hard to think about babies in the hospital. Um, So most people don't, um, but we do. You know, one of the things you mentioned too, is, you know, networking with other folks to kind of figure this out, right? To, to kind of ask questions. What, you know, for folks at home that might be interested, you know, this is a nonprofit, as you mentioned, what has been some of the difficulties about starting this nonprofit that folks at home 
should be aware of if they're interested in starting a nonprofit, or maybe what are some things that may have been a little bit easier? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, I think there's kind of an old adage in nonprofits where um, it's the idea of replicating services and support. So if, um, if there isn't really a nonprofit doing the work that you want to do, that means it's a, probably a good idea to start one. Um, yeah. But nonprofits are, um, they're expensive and there it's a lot of work to start one. Um, and there's a lot of really great mission-based nonprofits. I mean, they're all mission-based, but, um, folks that are, um, very kind of mission driven that have nonprofits already. Um, and so, you know, advice that we got early on was like, if you, if there's another nonprofit doing the same work that you're doing, um, you know, think about supporting them or working with them. Um, but there really, um, there wasn't anyone in our space and there wasn't really anyone p- providing the exact um, kind of holistic family infant support um, that we do. And so it made a lot of sense to um, start our own nonprofit. Nice. You know, one of the things you mentioned was was the funding piece, you know, it, it is expensive. How does, how did, how did Fox Boxes, how did you begin your funding? Did you kind of go grassroots efforts? Did you you go out to angel investors and, and for the folks at home. So they just, so they're aware if they need to start a nonprofit, they can kind of have an idea of how that looks. Yeah. We get our funding from people like you, from anyone listening. We are, um, our funding comes from individual contributors. So families, people, um, parents, um, grandparents. Uh, we also were able to partner with some really amazing brands to get um, in-kind donations. So products that are donated. Um, uh, Ergo Baby um, was our kind of first uh, company that believed in our mission and us. And um, so that's why we get to support uh, support families with really amazing um, uh, infant carriers so they can pick between a wrap or a structured carrier um, and also support pillows. Awesome. And, and you've actually, so your team actually collaborates with with quite a bit of different uh, partners, correct? Uh, other than Ergo Baby, I think. Yeah. You know, for baby pants and, and Angel <laughs> Deer and Yeti got some pretty amazing organizations. How, how did your team kind of collaborate? How did that all occur? Yeah, I think that's the idea of um, community. And um, I have spent a lot of time um, just in the design space. And I really, I went to LinkedIn and I found connections at those companies. Um, One of our board members was connected to um, some of them. And so we were able to, uh, find connections there. Um, we, the pie community has been really wonderful and amazing with trying to help connect the dots. Um, so we really were very intentional about every single brand that we partnered with. And there's a reason why we partnered with every single brand. Um, I think the life in the hospital is really tough. Um, it's emotionally tough. It's physically tough on objects and cleaning. Um, so we wanted to make sure that everything we include in our boxes could withstand the harsh environment that's living in a hospital. Um, so we were very, very intentional about every single brand and every single product that we put in our boxes to make sure it's the very best. And I think that plays back into the hope piece. Um, you know, we want to provide families with the very best baby products possible. I love it. And you, you, Again, you went to Dornbecker where hope is discovered, right? Yeah. Kind of their, their inspiration, their, their, their motto. Now, what advice would you give an aspiring entrepreneur interested in your industry? I think it's really important to, um, again, look and see if there's another nonprofit that's doing um, work that is similar to what you want to do um, and seeing if you can support them um, or do a program with them. Um, and if not, I think it's really important to have um, good storytelling. Um, and so that's what we focus a lot on at Fox Box is how can we um, tell meaningful stories, increase awareness for um, babies who have really long hospital stays, for families who experience that really long hospital stay. Um, and how can we um, help kind of change the conversation about it and um, provide the most support that we can. Um, I also think it's really important to find um, board members 
Um, so when you start a nonprofit, you need a board and, um, that board helps drive the direction. Um, so when we thought about, um, the board for Foxbox, um, I wanted to make sure that we kind of captured, um, skill sets, um, that were important, um, and folks that had a, a passion for the pediatric space and co- who could approach it from a lot of different perspectives. Nice. Now, now one of the things you mentioned was, you know, this is a nonprofit and, and this funding comes from individuals like myself, as well as our listeners. So with that said, how can the listeners find you, the business, social media, webpage, how can they, if they're interested, get more invested into Fox Boxes? I love that question. Thank you for asking it. Um, so we are um, foxboxes.org. Um, and then we're on Instagram. Um, our, our handle is Fox Box Baby. We're also on TikTok. Um, so a lot of the behind the scenes um, <laughs> box building, TikTok's amazing. Um, it happens on TikTok so you can see us build boxes, what we include, why we include them. And then our Instagram has our family stories. It has our drop-offs and um, kind of our, our longer form evergreen kind of social stories there. Love it. Kat Miller, the founder of Fox Boxes. Thank you for tuning in to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow the Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.